this is the thing I never wanted anybody to know. And I remember thinking it to myself, dead man walking. You know, like I'm walking out to the bike, like I can't back out. I could back out now, but it would be bad. But then when it was done, it was just like, it was like a milestone. It was like a personal milestone. It's the TMI Project Podcast, a series of stories about the too much information parts of ourselves we usually leave out because we're too ashamed or embarrassed. I'm your host, Eva Tenuto. This is season three, Stories for Choice. Before we get started, just want to let you know that as the TMI implies, some content might be too much information for some listeners. And remember, your support keeps our content free and accessible to everyone who wants to listen. So if you like what you hear and you're able to chip in, you can do so at tmiproject.org, where you'll also find some really great merch. Either way, thank you. We are so glad you're listening. Let's dive right in. I was the first male participant in the TMI workshops. Um, It was mostly women. It was all women up until then. Yep, it's true. Brian was the first man to take a TMI project workshop and share his story. And we were glad to have him because once other men saw him sharing his story, they signed up to do the same. When talking about reproductive choice, men are often left out of the conversation. We believe we increase our chance of protecting our rights if we have as many people as possible passionately involved in the fight. Our Stories for Choice workshops are open to everyone. Stick around after Brian's story to hear how facing his fear and sharing his truth paid off in spades. I recently searched on Facebook for my ex. There she is. I've been considering contacting her to apologize to her, but will contacting her help at all? Or will it just open up old wounds for her? Besides, Facebook seems like the wrong place to do it. I mean, what would I do? Send her a friend request? Then post on our wall, hey, sorry I asked you to marry me, then took it back. Sorry I was a coward and trashed our relationship, LOL. Over the years, I've contemplated sending her a letter of apology, but before I could write it, would dismiss the thought as pointless and maybe even cruel. It's not pleasant to know that someone out there in the world is still so angry and hurt by me after so long. It's hard to share this with you because I'm afraid your judgment will be even harsher than my own. I've been carrying a burden of guilt and shame for many years, She once described our meeting in December 1999 in front of the post office in the East Village as preordained by a spell she cast to attract love, a spell involving a butternut squash. To this day, the sight of a butternut squash gives me the willies. Well, the spell appears to be working quite nicely. I fall hard. I'm drawn to her earthiness, her keen intelligence, knowledge of herbs, her deep, committed feminism. She's sexy, fierce, and righteous. She even eats righteously. At first, I find this new relationship refreshing. Yeah, men do need to be put in their place. There is oppression of women. Meat really is murder. Technology is a threat to the natural order. But I need my cell phone for work. I like the occasional steak. I like looking at women's breasts. As time passes, I notice she's got some rules. Rules that I must live by and penalties for not following them. (laughs) I begin to doubt whether I can live by these rules. But by then, I'm in deep. It's hard to back out now. I mean, we own a cat together. (laughs) She keeps tabs. She keeps score. Once, while visiting my sister, she spies me eating a Dunkin' Munchkin and scolds me, saying, how often do you do this sort of thing? (laughs) We need to talk about this later. 
a Dunkin' Munchkin. Not even a whole donut. A donut hole. I'm not having as much fun as I used to. The honeymoon period has passed. I now fear the very thing I was drawn to. Her righteousness seems like rage. Her intelligence now seems calculating. Her principles seem rigid and inflexible. But I'm afraid to speak up. So when the pregnancy happens, I snap. I feel trapped. Things get really complicated really fast. I cannot have a child with her. I'm desperate not to have this thing that would bind me to a woman I suddenly realize I no longer love, but am too afraid to break free from. I lie and tell her that the timing is not right, that it would be better to wait. And even though she's 39 and there's not much time, I promise her we'll get another chance. To placate her and buy myself some time, I ask her to marry me. The pregnancy, the abortion, then my father dies. I feel crazy. I can no longer lie. I'm too exhausted, yet I'm too afraid to tell the truth. So instead, I just tell her to go away. Get the fuck out. I am completely checked out. I am gone. But I've been here before. In my 20s, I had such a crush on this woman, Wendy, but she only wanted to be friends, with benefits. We had sex now and then. At one point, she came to me and told me that a month or so before, she had an abortion and that the baby was mine. I was so devastated that she hadn't told me and also that she aborted our child. I cried for weeks. It took me years to get over it, and yet now, the tables have turned, and Leslie needs more than I can or want to give. There are no do-overs. But wait, you know what? There are do-overs. This story, this is just the only story where there's clear evidence. It's a theme. The fear, the avoidance, the not speaking up, the sheer cowardice. I've done it over and over. I do it over and over. It has got to stop. I need to face my fear, replace cowardice with courage, shame with honor, guilt with forgiveness. There's only one thing left to do. Dear Leslie, I'm writing to apologize to you and try to atone for my behavior toward you during our time together. It's 10 years since that time in our lives. 10 years of avoiding the truth. It's long overdue. I have gone over the events as I remember them and acknowledge that I hurt you deeply in many ways. I behaved cruelly and without regard for your feelings. I lied to you and misled you. I rejected you when you most needed care and comfort. I can see it now. I could not see it then. You did not deserve to be treated this way. Everything has its price. I'm infertile now. I will never be a father. I need to finally tell you that I'm profoundly sorry for the pain and suffering I caused you. I truly hope that this letter will help bring the relief you deserve and an easing of the burdens we both carry. I can't hope or expect you to forgive me, but it's what I need to ask of you. And if you can, find it in your heart to forgive me and perhaps that will finally set us both free with sorrow and regret and the very best of wishes, Brian. We caught up with Brian recently and here's what he had to say. You know, I can own it all and I can be as flawed and, you know, attempting to be better. I don't have to hide from it. It's just changed me in that. It's deepened my relationship with my wife, which is the most important thing in my life. So for anything, if, that, if, if nothing else positive happened, that's enough. A very special thanks to Brian for sharing his story. And I can't thank Brian without also mentioning the woman he is lucky enough to be married to, Sari Botten. 
Sari served as TMI Project's editorial director for the first seven years of the organization. Sari and I created the foundation of TMI Project's methodology together. We are so grateful for all of her dedication, time, and talent that helped us in our formative years, and also for her influence in getting her husband, the first man, to sign up for a workshop. Thanks, Sari. If you're male-identified or have male-identified people in your life who might be interested, check out the work of our partners, A Call to Men, a highly acclaimed national organization creating a world where all men and boys are loving and respectful, and all women, girls, and those at the margins are valued and safe. Stay tuned for the next episode when Crystal shares a story about adoption, riding the high of optimistic anticipation, and navigating the blow of a heartbreaking loss. I'm Eva Tenuto. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps. TMI Project is available to offer true storytelling workshops and performances for your school or workplace. This episode of Season 3 of the TMI Project podcast, Stories for Choice, was produced in partnership with Radio Kingston. It was written by me and edited, produced, and mixed by Daisha Clay. Our theme song is Secrets by Edison Woods. Our operations and programs manager is Blake File. Our marketing and digital coordinator is Laura Marie Ruoco. Our administrative assistant is Elijah Jackson. Our graphic designer is Lauren Gill. Our workshop leaders are Perla Iora, Capely Kalnick, Haley Downs, Jonathan Gonzalez, Rain Grayson, Ray Lipkin, Dara Laurie, Micah, Julie Novak, Blake File, and me, Eva Tenuto. To learn more, support our work, and find a special writing prompt so you can start telling your story, visit tmiproject.org slash podcast. <laughs>